Knowing how to remember trivia questions and the answers that go with those questions can make you a lot of money. But there are other reasons you might want a full arsenal of memorization tricks at your side for information that either is trivial or just seems trivial. I mean, in addition to making bank, being at the ready with lots of interesting tidbits can be personally fulfilling, it can be professionally useful, it can be an alternative to physical sports for people who aren't able to engage in sports or don't want to, they just want a different level of competition. And it can be a great way to socialize with other people who also have heads filled with facts. And of course, that means it can be a source of social capital. Plus, being fascinated with trivia doesn't necessarily mean that the information is trivial, far from it in many contexts. It can give you lots of interesting brain exercise and wonderful ways to think about the myriad of connections that structure the world. So if you're new here, riddle me this, how fast can you get subbed to this channel and how fast, for the love of memory, you can hit that thumbs up as we dig into the strategies that go into being able to memorize trivia, both for game-like outcomes, but also just for greater fulfillment in life. The key is really to bring together a number of techniques and strategies. I'm talking about keeping up with current events and world news. I'm talking about watching other trivia shows and game shows at large, being able to beef up on categorical thinking, because a lot of trivia comes down to being able to rotate in your mind through different categories, and then using chunking while you're reading and Maybe you want to get into mental calculation and so forth. There's a lot of things that will really help. But this is really key. You need deliberate practice under stress. And this is important because one of the things about trivia, either when you're playing a trivia game or just in real life, you want to be able to recall back these little facts is that you're often stressed to do so. And when we're under stress, sometimes our memory can clamp up. So when you use these techniques we're going to talk about today, make sure that you practice in situations of stress. So what that can mean is as you master mnemonics, you practice memorizing trivial facts with noises on, loud heavy metal, or you practice while you're on a train, that sort of thing. So let's get started with mnemonics. Now, broadly speaking, you probably know this, but a mnemonic is anything that helps you remember something. That means that rote learning is also technically a mnemonic. It's just pretty low on the power scale because rote learning takes too long. That's why people use mnemonic devices like the memory palace, linking, number systems like the major system, etc. And there are even more advanced systems like a PAO system that can help you memorize numbers and all of these approaches basically have in common association through mental imagery. Now, if you've seen my video on mental imagery, you know that it's not necessarily just about pictures. It can be about a wide variety of mental associations, sounds, kinesthetic feelings, and so forth. So if you wanna get better at trivia, you wanna get very familiar with each of these mnemonic approaches and then practice mnemonics beyond just images. So if you're trying to memorize a fact about Pluto, like for example, the date that it became a planet and then the date that it exited the status of planethood, then you wanna have a number system that'll help you remember both those dates, but you wanna have a number system that translates into associations that you can feel physically, you can hear in your mind's ear, that you can visualize visually, but also have an emotion around and maybe relate to other concepts and maybe tastes and smells, and then think about the sizes. Those are some of the major ways to elaborate using mnemonics, and that's what helps you avoid rote learning and get more out of less time. The other thing is, is to learn how to extend those memory techniques to volume. So once you've got basic mnemonics going for yourself, you wanna get good at extracting information from a variety of sources, and then be able to scale the amount that you can memorize. And one of the things that I really love is a very special textbook memorization technique I'll tell you a little bit about later. But for now, one thing to get used to is memorizing keywords and try to figure out a system where you can manage those keywords and put them into memory palaces. So memory palaces are basically rooms that are based on familiar locations, and then you extract the information 
from the books or whatever source of information that you're getting it from, and then you place your images on the wall. So if it was a date, for example, we're going to have an image that represents the date and it can be on the bookshelf or the wall and so forth. Then you revisit that image and basically you, the image is going to tell you what the target information is and then write it out. This writing step is really important. Memory expert Lynn Kelly calls handwriting a powerful encryption tool in the science of memory. I would go a little step further. I would say it's the ultimate tool. Now, sure, if you want to build up your trivia knowledge, you can use Anki or some other spaced repetition software, but you're quite possibly diminishing the amount you can remember when you do this. And the reason why is because a lot of people get tempted to add more cards before they've mastered what they already have. And the memory palace technique is not going to guarantee that you don't move on before you master the material that you've already encoded, but it's going to help reduce that because once you've put in the effort to build a memory palace with say 10 pieces of trivia, then you're going to do the recall rehearsal and that's going to help to get that information into long-term memory. Technically, it's not a memory palace if you don't use it for the establishment of long-term recall of the facts. Let's talk a little bit more about reading. Now, you don't always have to place the information into memory palaces. You can be a little bit more direct depending on your level of skill. So, for example, I was reading a Latin and a book about Latin and Greek origins earlier today, and I learned that sitos, the Greek for sitting and eating, usually at the side of another person, this is part of the word parasitos, where we get our word parasite. Now, my pronunciation there may be a little bit off. I wasn't trying to memorize the pronunciation in this case, but just trying to remember that little trivial fact about sitos. And to re remember this, I don't really need to do anything other than chunk it together with a quick mental image of Superman sitting beside a guy I know named Perry at a Safeway grocery store. And Superman is a peg word I use a lot for words or word parts that start with S. And I have many, many other images for each and every letter of the alphabet, and in many cases, multiple images for each letter of the alphabet. But the point here is, is that I'm chunking the core information together and I'm using the book itself as a memory palace. Now, this is where having number systems is really, really useful because the page that this information was on, every time you, well, not every time, but almost every time you look at a page, there's a number there. And that number, if you have number systems, will always have an image, which you can then entangle with the information. So that's just a, a quick example of something that can help you just memorize in real time while you're reading and just pick up little facts like that. And yeah, I mean, CITOS, it's part of the word uh, origin of parasite and it's just l learned in real time without going to the step of having a formal memory palace. However, for best results, I would still deeply consider putting that into a memory palace so that recall rehearsal can be used. Now, another thing that you might want to do is learn mental calculation, because a lot of facts involve numbers related to historical dates, how much things weigh, how old things are, distances, etc. And when you're using number techniques in addition to mental calculation, then you're just going to have that extra level of skill. And you know, you might want to master the Trachtenberg method, for example, develop a basic understanding of Vedic math, etc. Because this is going to also just make you more interesting and you know give you more things to talk about between events at trivia night. And it's just really fun to be able to do that with your mind. So I don't know what particular edge it's going to give you, but I just highly recommend it because it's going to just be part of your overall mental conditioning. And when the conditions are right, well, as they say, where opportunity meets preparation, there is no ceiling. And I, I've lived this myself. I mean, practicing with the memory techniques. One time I was just going to be a, what shall we say, a memory journalist at a memory competition. And I was able to compete with Dave Farrow. He, was, he basically wasn't going to let me out of there <laughs> without competing with someone. So I competed with him for charity. And, you know, I, I didn't fall flat on my face. And I'd never competed before. I'd never practiced for competition. I had no context dependent memory in order to do so. But part of it wasn't just that I had practiced memorizing cards that I was able to do really quite well in the competition with him. 
But also I have spent time with some mental calculation because I have done over the years what's called mem deck work, which is a memorized deck, and you have to do calculations while you're doing that. I won't get into basic magic secrets of the, of the, of the magic siblinghood, but at the end of the day, it's really, really important to uh, have some of that in your background because it just helps you on the fly in ways that you can't even anticipate because I never would have helped that that extra edge would help me focus there, but it did. And just having that familiarity is really important. Now, about me still doing well at a competition without practicing competition, that's not a good policy overall. If you're really going to go to trivia competitions, you want to practice trivia under stress. And USA memory champ, Nelson Dellis, he coached us once when he hosted the Magnetic Memory Method podcast. And he said, if you want to win a memory competition, you need to not only practice the memory techniques, but you need to practice competition itself. And one way to edge yourself up to it is to practice in low stress environments before taking it to the big stress environments. So you can play trivia games, and access your memory in noisy places where your concentration is going to be taxed. And try to play with people who understand your goals and who are going to help you balance the challenges and the frustrations that come from accessing your memory in real time, in, in situations where the points matter and timing matters so that you're not wasting too much time or if you actually have a clock on. Because that's another benefit I think I had when I competed with Dave Farrow is that I'd also practiced a lot with clocks on and it helped me just be relaxed in order to get the best possible performance in a situation where I wasn't practiced. But I can't help but wonder how well I would have done if I actually had practiced with this stressful environment more often in my life and with a clock on. And you really just want to also make sure that you lean into frustration as much as possible as you continue working on trivia, not only for competition purposes, but also just in real life. Because if you don't take risks, you're not going to grow your skills as much as you possibly could. So what you want to do is take yourself into challenge until the point that you get frustrated, but not so much that you frustrate yourself into giving up. Now, what challenges you may want to lean into with trivia are really up to you, but really you have obscurity, uh, volume of obscurity, and you have basically greater technical information, information that has multiple moving parts. And ultimately, as you go through this, another major tip is to keep a progress journal because a progress journal will help you keep honest to yourself, but also give you a point of reminding yourself of how far that you've come. So we've talked about handwriting as an encryption tool. You can take it a step further. And if you haven't seen the episode with memory athlete Johannes Malo, he's used journaling a great deal to improve as a memory athlete. And you know, it, it, it really has a, an effect that you can't quite describe until that you've been in it. Keeping a journal helps with consistency. It also can help that you have an object in your environment that you see every day, which helps remind you of your commitment to practice. And you know, you can have large journals, small journals, etc. But I journal frequently, and I'm not particularly tidy about it. It's just about summarizing what I've memorized throughout the day or what I want to do in the future, brain dump through any obstacles, and it just keeps the consistency of the practice going. So you've got to consider that because you are going to better enable yourself to lean into challenges and then track your results, find out where you're getting frustrated, forge new paths forward, and basically win, you know, because <laughs> you're just going to optimize everything through observation of where you are. The key is to be radically honest. And so one of the techniques where radical honesty really comes in key is the memory palace technique. If you haven't taken my free memory improvement course, just visit magneticmemorymethod.com. You can sign up for it there or just dive into the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass. You're going to learn how to create a vast web of associations in your mind by tapping into spatial memory as the palette on which you paint. And that way you're going to win trivia night. You're going to enjoy knowledge that will stand the test of time, you'll be able to remember in real time because that 
page on a book technique that I talked about, I doubt I would have been able to do that if I hadn't first worked with traditional memory palaces. And if you want to know more about this technique that I was talking about, where you can use textbooks in quite an optimal way, stick around and watch my video on how to memorize a textbook next. Some people have accused me of lowballing the number of details from textbooks to a trivial number, but I can tell you as a person with a PhD and a holder of one of Germany's most important research grants under my belt, I really got to tell you less is more with this approach. And I've had some mighty impressive paydays on what a lot of people have thought was trivial information indeed. I mean, I was doing art history and film studies and getting into the nooks and crannies of philosophy, bump effluvia. Well, what can I say? I had fun and I love trivial information and I don't find it trivial at all. So go ahead and watch that video on how to memorize a textbook next until we have a chance to speak again. Thanks for watching and keep yourself magnetic.